while I was uh, preparing this, I think it was Jerry who sent me an email saying that this was National Friends Day. And I thought that we'd talk a little bit about, well, being friendly. My sermon is entitled Porch Music, <clears throat> and uh, it includes three songs that I wrote on the porch at Cornerstone Baptist Church. Many of you know that I come out of the American Baptist tradition. Um, and uh, it was an interesting place to be. Well, you know, it was interesting, but it was tough as, as, you know, as time went on and my theology began to change and I began to challenge myself on uh, many of the tenets of the faith that I was preaching, um, well, that led me here, where it's much more comfortable. <laughs> But the church that I pastored last, Cornerstone Baptist Church, Danielson, Connecticut, um, was a church that I had really dreamed about having because I always wanted to have an opportunity to be in a downtown church. You know, they say you do your best work, uh, best stuff on Main Street, right? Well, we were only one block off. We were on Broad Street. And where we were located on Broad Street, on one side of the church grounds was uh, the Access Agency. Um, they were the folks who were the gatekeepers for all of Connecticut's um, uh, uh, helping services, uh, welfare and, uh, uh, and, and SNAP and all those different kind of things. Uh, on the other side of the street down half a block was the family shelter. Across from them was the Medicaid um, uh, quick, uh, uh, you know, when you have an injury or you need to you know, drop in, you can do that there. Up the hill from um, our parsonage, which was right next to the church, was the teen girls shelter. Down the road, about six blocks, you're not supposed to know this because it was the battered women's shelter, and that was kind of, you had to keep that secret. And then one block down was Superior Court. So we were right in the middle of the action. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great place to do ministry. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that my wife Cheryl and I did, uh, we called it porch ministry. We had a beautiful wraparound porch in an antique um, a Victorian. It was a, just a beautiful parsonage. Uh, and we were uh, out there often in the mornings before I had to report to work and in the evenings after dinner uh, playing some guitar and we greeted everybody that walked by. And a lot of the folks walking by were the very people that, um, that kind of needed to know that somebody was there that cared about them. And so we told everybody, whether they were the folks that were living in the woods behind the railroad tracks in back of uh, uh, the supermarket, or whether it was the folks that were struggling on the street that we lived in, some of the uh, old Victorians had been carved up into apartments. Um, uh, we told them all, and as we met them, uh, that uh, they were welcome. They were welcome on our porch. If we were out and the candles were on, that means we're open for business. Come on up and we'll have some fun. And if it's raining and there's nobody on the porch, you can use our porch for shelter. And people took advantage of that and we made some great friends. You know, uh, oftentimes you know, in a church, you, you know, you, you watch people walk by your church, you don't know them, who they are, what their stories are and so on. But as soon as you open yourself up to being able to, um, uh, to express yourself to them and let them know you care, all of a sudden you've gone from a stranger to a friend. Every church has its own unique gifts um, and its own unique challenges, depending on where it's located. So this church was a downtown church. I've served country churches and suburban churches, and every church has its own niche when it comes to uh, what they do and, and how they um, uh, interact with the communities around them. The Parsonage Porch. I wrote the three songs that I'll be singing for you today. Hopefully I'll get through them okay. And, um, uh, and these were all written kind of in response to things that were going on around us. Just to give you a little idea of the kind of folks that we were uh, ministering to, porch ministry, um, there was a young lady named Faith. And Faith um, had some personality disorders and it caused her to be extremely paranoid. We moved her four times because people kept on opening her mail, tapping her phones. Um, uh, and so on, and she couldn't stay in any one place because she would get to that point where she felt that, um, that everybody was prying into her lives. So Faith became one of our friends. She uh, uh, came and stopped by the porch often. One memorable night, she stopped by at about 10.30 at night. I was, we were just packing up and getting ready to go, and she wanted to know if we had any money so that she can get soap for her laundry. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I give you some laundry detergent? And I went inside and got out a, you know, Ziploc plastic bag and you know poured the right amount of um, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, washing 
stuff. You ever have your words fail you? I don't know. It was washing stuff. So here I am, I've gone to the porch, i got this white powder in a plastic bag. <laughs> handing it to a young lady on the street. Did I mention the police station was just three blocks down the other direction? <laughs> Then there was Stephen, and St Stephen, I, I, I was another person. He, he, you know, when we talk, when you listen to politicians and they want to have work requirements for some social services, there are some people who need those services who can't work. And well, uh, Stephen was one of those. Um, Stephen didn't know what boundaries were all that well. We had to teach him that. But uh, Stephen was uh, one of our favorite characters. And we gave rides to jobs for you know people who was just starting a job, didn't have a vehicle. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, my wife uh, gave rides to um, the to Faith uh, over to Rhode Island to get to their food bank because you can only hit the one in town tw uh, every other week. But it was it was an interesting place to be. So the first song I want to share with you um, is called "The Ballad of Broad Street," and uh, this song is um, uh, is one that. Um, uh, it gives you little vignettes of things that happened on the street. Now, these things all happened. They just all didn't happen in the same day, but, you know, for you know, poetic license or whatever, I crammed them into a day. But uh, this first song is um, The Ballad of Broad Street. I'm going to make bold with one of these, okay? Sure. I'll put it back exactly where it was. Maybe. I promised myself I'd do this before I started. Sunrise, blue skies, all I could want from the day. A gentle breeze blows the smell of breakfast my way. I hear a hand slap through an open door. It ain't nothing I ain't heard before. Another quiet morning on my street. School there waving goodbye. She does the laundry and the dishes and the bus has them home around five. She works four hours at the grocery store. To just get by she needs a few hours more. But she gets paid in house when the kids get home.
she skips across the lawn feel the light as air grabs the key hidden under the chair and the screen door slams and the lights go out upstairs late night porch light broad street goes off to sleep It was an interesting place to do ministry. And I was really so proud of the church because, you know, they kind of caught that fever too. And it was um, uh, one of the greatest displays of, um, of befriending that I've ever seen. You know, we can, we can make friends, uh, we can uh, accumulate friends, uh, you know, we remember our friends, but to befriend somebody might be a little bit different. Now, Larry, was a little bit different. Um, Larry was, um, he had the mental acuity maybe of a 12 year old. Uh, when, he, when we met him, he was in his 60s. Uh, he had been shuffling around from church to church to church and nobody knew quite what to do with Larry. Larry was an overly enthusiastic person when it came to wanting to help. And if you let him, he'd do everything. And he was actually quite competent at some things. Um, but the other churches really didn't know how to handle that, uh, especially with somebody who didn't have the intellectual rigor that they had and so on. And I think he got marginalized and frustrated. But finally, one day, he walked through our doors. And it took a little time. But a few of the folks in the congregation befriended Larry. Uh, to give you an idea, Larry, when he first came in, he wanted to help with everything. So we said, okay, Larry, uh, there's some certain things that you can do. We need it done every, every morning. Uh, you know, you can put the signs out for handicapped parking. Uh, you can, uh, you know, take care of the pastor's water glass, make sure the mics are turned on. Uh, you know, during the week, you want to come in, we, you know, our, our, the brass needs to be polished, the candlesticks, the uh, offering plates. Uh, one of my uh, friends uh, was the, the bell choir director. He had him polishing bells. But Larry wanted more, and I had to hold him back. Larry, other people have jobs that they love doing too. You can't do their job. Would you like it if somebody went out and put out those handicap signs and it wasn't? Oh, no, I wouldn't like it. Well, hmm, you got to let other folks do their job. So about every month, I had to give Larry the long list of things that he did every, every week and say, Larry, you know, you're doing a lot right now. We got to let some of the other folks use their gifts and their talents. And Larry understood that. Larry had never been uh, out of Danielson, Connecticut. And Danielson, Connecticut is a very, very small, old textile town. Uh, the mills are all gone or, or broken down and, or, or demolished at this point. Um, and uh, there's a lot of poverty there because when those jobs went away, well, they, you know, they, were, they were gone for good. The tallest thing that Larry had ever seen was the steeple on the Congregational Church at, on the green. Maybe about 125, 130 feet in the air total. One summer, the, the um, uh, museum, one of the museums down in New York City was hosting uh, the traveling um, Dead Sea Scroll exhibit. And I was part of an interfaith group, uh, the, the, uh, the synagogue and several mainline Christian churches. And we planned a bus trip down to New York to see the, you know, to, to see the exhibit. And Larry really wanted to go. Well, Larry's um, uh, helper from the state uh, came to us quite concerned because if Larry got lost in New York, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't know how to get home. Uh, he'd be stuck there and you'd never see him again probably. So she was very insistent and you know, she, even when he goes to the bathroom, you have to have somebody with him because you know, if he wanders off, that's it. So a couple of the gentlemen in the church, I went approached them and I said, you know, this is the case, you're gonna be there, can you take care of Larry? And oh yeah, we'll take care of Larry, it's pretty fine. When he got off the bus in Times Square, I don't think his mouth was 
ever closed. It was agape the entire time he was outside. He had such fun that day. We had a great picture of him. He was wearing these, um, these plaid shorts. He had this old t-shirt on and so on. This guy always had a smile on his face. And that trip brought those gentlemen closer to Larry. Um, I, was, uh, I wanted to put on an addition uh, to demolish the old porch in back of the parsonage because it was small and falling apart and uh, put on a new one. And I got permission from the board and they appropriated the money and I had Lowe's dump a bunch of lumber in the driveway. And I had um, uh, you know, the, the, the head of, uh, of, of you know, buildings and maintenance. He was gonna help me and we we're gonna build this porch. Two days before it was supposed to start, I fell down the front porch steps and broke my leg. <laughs> I wasn't going to be building a porch. So I said to this gentleman, I said, yeah, I, you know, why don't I call Larry? I mean, he knows how to use tools and he just needs direction. Well, I don't know. I'll give him a try. If it doesn't work out, hey, we'll do this in a couple of weeks when I can get around better. Well, he met Larry. Larry came over. They worked all day long. Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't see them before they left. But the next morning at 8 o'clock, I got a call from uh, my head of buildings and maintenance. Would you uh, give Larry a call and <laughs> see if he'd come down and help me again? <laughs> And together they built that porch and it was fabulous. So this is the kind of thing, you know, that Larry was craving was, the, was somebody caring whether or not uh, they wanted him there and, they, and he had something to do that was important. And now he felt as if he had something to do that was important. Larry um, was a diabetic and one night he had walked to the other side of town about three miles away. Uh, he must have been having a low sugar event uh, because Larry didn't drink but the way he was stumbling and mumbling when he went into the restaurant to ask for a Coke, they kind of threw him out thinking he was drunk. About five minutes later, he was killed by a train. It was a tragedy in the community. Everybody knew Larry because he walked everywhere and he greeted everybody with that great big smile. So Larry deserved a ballad. And uh, this really kind of centers around the community's reaction to a great loss. So let me uh, share with you Larry's song. This is like um, wearing a belt and suspenders. Was I loud enough in the first song? Could everybody hear? More volume, gotcha, okay. Larry Bean from the Parsonage porch Each Sunday morning round eight Waiting for his chance to help, you know He didn't want to be late He polished brass on candlesticks And offering plates and bells Offered it on to the lame and sore And made sure that no one fell You know the gifts we think are so precious The gifts so many seek Lie tarnished by a man in plaid shorts an old t-shirt and rosy cheeks and hugs enough for everyone he met Jesus loves you he told everyone lest anyone forget 60 years as a 12 year old as gentle as they came Larry's life ended suddenly an encounter with the train you know the gifts we think are so precious if so many seek lie tarnished by a man in plaid shorts, an old t-shirt, 
and rosy cheeks. The day of the memorial, it dawned bright, but somehow changed. Pastor looked at his front porch, no Larry. <laughs> now that was strange. Then he smiled when a reporter asked, Is there a story here? He knew right then this memorial could be the blessing of the year. Because the gifts we think are so precious, and the gifts so many seek, lie tarnished by a man in plaid shorts. An old t-shirt and rosy cheeks. The family, most from far away, arrived and filled the front pew. Who else would show? They couldn't know, but they figured just a few. When the first of Larry's friends arrived, they whispered, now that was sweet. Later on, when the service began, we couldn't find a seat. The gifts we think are so precious, the gifts so many seek, lie tarnished by a man in Clad shorts, an old t-shirt, and rosy cheeks. So many friends, they laughed and cried as they shared their memories. They shared the gifts that Larry shared with them each and every week. He talked of how he cared so much for everyone. And then a sobbing voice from that front pew cried, I wish I'd known that man. The gifts we think are so precious. The gifts so many seek lie tarnished by a man in Plaid shorts, an old t-shirt, and rosy cheeks. It's been many years since that day, but not a month goes by. Something little happened, you know. <laughs> Larry's brought to mind. Maybe the lights weren't turned off, or the pastor's water glass was dry. Somebody'll say, you know, that was Larry's job. With a, a twinkle in their eyes, the gifts we think are so precious. The gifts so many seek lie tarnished by a man in. Plaid shorts, an old t-shirt, and rosy cheeks. Thank you for being so kind over my stumbling fingers. <laughs> so, you know,
friends that we met, and you know, they're right there in the neighborhood. They walk by, they come in. Uh, many times they wouldn't darken the door of the church, but they were welcome on the parsonage porch. And we built a community around that, and our church really um, uh, uh, expanded uh, their offerings and the things we did. And, um, and our church was regularly used uh, for clothing swaps and a meeting place for the heads of the different agencies that helped in town. And um, uh, we had. Uh, uh, Christmas parties for the, the teen girls up the street. Uh, we did so many things, and it was so beautiful. It was a wonderful experience. But you know, in that, you start thinking out further than your boundaries. And this was during uh, the reign of King George II, uh, that is Bush. Um, Unfortunately, uh, issues around uh, immigration and border security is not a new thing. I mean, uh, all you have to do is uh, you know, talk to folks about, uh, oh, geez, the, ask the Native Americans about that. <laughs> uh, or the Irish who came during the potato famine, or the French Canadians, or the Huguenots, or the Chinese, or anybody else that came into this country. There was always an issue around immigration. From a strictly biblical perspective. Remember, I was a Baptist preacher. You know. um, it is a sin against God to harm or turn away or fail to protect the alien in your midst. It's right there in scripture many times. Verses such as, cursed be anyone who deprives the alien, an orphan, or a widow of justice. Or, thus saith the Lord, Act with justice and righteousness and deliver from the, land, from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the alien, the orphan, or the widow and shed no innocent blood. The Hebrew Bible says that we're protected, we are to protect the traveler in our land. The Christian Testament says, love your neighbor. And John Lennon said, better recognize your brothers, everyone you meet. People who enter our country seeking work and working in some of the most difficult and dangerous occupations that many folks here don't want to do, like whether that's picking crops in the hot summer heat, whether it's working in slaughterhouses, roofing buildings, they are to be respected. They are to be protected if our society is to be a just one. Instead, we read and we see those crossing our border in the South as being persecuted, killed, drowned, separated from their parents, and housed like criminals simply because they are in search of a better life in a country where, ironically, their labor is sorely needed. This is my last song that I'll torture you with. It's called Illegally Yours, and it's a response to the news stories back in that day of migrants being um, hunted down by vigilantes. On the day I said goodbye, I knew that I would make you cry, but I always thought I'd see you smile again. Cantaloupes and strawberries, we made enough from picking these, enough to send some home and keep you safe and dry. To where the highway ends Another field Another crop to gather in Yeah, we're in the truck again Like to where the highway ends Another field Another crop to gather in With baseball bats And shotgun shells made our lives a living hell 
We fled the shack into the glare of their headlights They ran us down on sandy ground We lay too scared to make a sound They shouted in a language we don't understand In the truck again Not to wear highway hands Another peel, another crop they gather in yeah, we're in the truck again Out to where the highway ends Another field, another crop they gather in I wish that I could see you smile the wall is just another mile I'm sorry I won't be there in your arms again A flash, a bang, a blinding light He promised he would make it right Ellison, you're into your arms I give my life In the truck again Out to where the highway ends Another field, another crop you gather in Yeah, we're in the truck again Out to where the highway ends Another field, another crop you gather in Porch music. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, El Senor, by the way, um, uh, when I was uh, uh, doing a, a peace conference trip down to, um, uh, down to Nicaragua, um, that was the term that was most open, uh, most uh, usually used to refer to God in Spanish churches. El Senor. Thank you for putting up to me and listening to me. I appreciate that.